Hello, everyone. It's unfortunate that we cannot meet in person, but this is the best we can do under the current circumstances. So what I would like to first of all say is to thank the organizers for, for arranging this workshop and having to change and adapt to current conditions as we as time changes. Now, what I would like to talk about is some work that I've been doing with Joja Beck and two of his students, Michael Dondas and Yusun Yang. It's on the distribution of uh, billiard orbits and geodesics in non integrable flat dynamical systems. Before we do that, let's look at the quintessential integrable dynamical system. This is just the linear one dimension, one direction geodesics in the flat torus in any dimension, at least two. And the behavior of these geodesics is governed by the very famous kronecker weil equal distribution theorem. By using linear independence of real numbers, one can actually work out some a lot of directions such that we have geodesics in these directions that are uniformly distributed in the unit torus. In the special case, when we are looking at the two-dimensional problem, then there is only one number gamma that is in question. And according to the kronecker weil equal distribution theorem, if gamma is irrational, then clearly we have uniform distribution. On the other hand, if gamma is rational, then it doesn't take much to work out that the geodesic must be periodic. Therefore, we either have uniform distribution or we have periodicity. And this is an example of the uniform periodic dichotomy. Now that's geodesics. How about billiard orbits in the unit square? All the way back to 1913, Koenig and Suess had this idea of unfolding one problem into another in the sense that when we have the billiard orbit in the unit square, we unfold it horizontally and vertically and make it into four squares. And we end up with a problem of one direction geodesics on the torus zero two square as shown in the picture here. And so it is enough, therefore, to concentrate on the study of one direction geodesics for this problem. Now, these are integrable systems. For integrable systems, if two particles move on parallel paths uh, that are initially close to each other, then the two paths remain closed forever. For non-integrable systems, that's not the case. We actually have splitting near singular points. And I'd like to first of all give some examples. For example, let's look at playing billiard on this L-shaped region. We can see the blue and the red paths starting quite close to each other. And then one went on the left side of a vertex and the other go past the right side of a vertex and then the paths end up rather different afterwards. Another example is one direction geodesics on the L surface. 
again illustrated here by the two paths in the two different colors. A third example is that we can consider geodesics on the cube surface. And when two paths get rather close to a vertex and one sneak off to the right hand side and the other sneak off to the left hand side, then the end result is again vastly different. So this splitting near singular points create these various different situations. Now, before we go any further, let's look at a few results concerning non-integrable flat systems. Let's consider a flat surface where every face is a polygon, where the angles are rational multiples of pi. We have a result of Kartok and Zemlyakov, which basically says that in many situations, we have geodesics that are dense. And then later, Kirchhoff, Mazur and Smilly prove that there are geodesics that are equally equal distributed. Next, let us consider finite polysquare regions. These are regions with finitely many unit size squares where any two such squares are either disjoint, like the two blue ones, or have a common vertex, like the pink ones, or have a common edge, like the green ones. And every two square faces are linked together by a chain of square faces where every consecutive square faces share a common edge. That's a finite polysquare region. And if we add edge identification to this, we turn this into a finite polysquare surface. Then there is the famous result of Gutkin and Veach, which says that you can either play billiard in the finite polysquare region, starting with an irrational initial slope, or one can consider a one direction geodesic on the finite polysquare surface with an irrational slope. And in either case, we get equal distribution unless we are unfortunate enough to hit the vertex. And indeed, there is also uniform periodic dichotomy. There is also the result of Veach, which concerns billiard in regular polygons. And again, he showed that there is uniform periodic dichotomy. All these results are qualitative results concerning non-integrable flat systems. They're qualitative in the sense that there is no information on the necessary time range in any of these results. That proves all use Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, which is time qualitative in the sense that it requires unlimited time range. What we are interested in is to obtain some time quantitative results on density and uniformity. And to this end, we have developed a non-ergodic approach that makes use of combinatorics, number theory, and linear algebra. And we call this the short line method. Now the term short line will become apparent in a few minutes. There are two versions of our method. One of them is eigenvalue three, and the argument depends on size magnification. And the other version 
is based on eigenvalues and eigenvectors of transition matrices, and they are quite different. Okay, to start talking about some results, let's go back a long, long time to Ehrenfest and Ehrenfest when they consider irregular wind tree model. This is where we are on the plane and there are obstacles that are squares and they are irregularly placed, although they, they, they are parallel to the vertical and horizontal axes. And we are playing billiard between, in the gaps between these obstacles. Well, this is a very irregular model and very little is known, but a few years ago, there is a result by Sabugao and Trubetskoy. Please forgive me if my pronunciation is incorrect. And they say that there are configurations such that the billet is ergodic in almost every initial direction. But then they didn't give any explicit configuration. Well, after this early model, in 1980, Hardy and Weber considered the periodic wintry model. Here we have obstacles that are the same, but they are reg placed in a very regular and periodic fashion. Here, there is the famous result of Frashek and Uchigrai where let's say we consider the configuration where the obstacles all have side length one and the gap between neighboring ones are equal to one as well. And we play billiard in the gaps in between. Then they show that in almost every initial direction, we don't get density. In other words, if we want density, then the choice of initial directions are very limited indeed. It's a set of measure zero. However, we managed to show that there are countably many explicitly given initial directions alpha, such that there are billiard orbits that are dense in this configuration with initial direction alpha. Not only that, we can describe the density in the time quantitative sense. Furthermore, we can have similar conclusions for many, for uncountably many modifications of this periodic configuration that become aperiodic. And I'll come to that later on. Let's go back and look at this periodic configuration. We can see that the building block of this configuration is the L shape, which is highlighted in yellow color. So let us study billiard in the L shape region first and see what we can do. Well, first of all, since we are playing billiard, let's convert the problem to a problem in, on one direction geodesics. So we follow Koenig and Suess, their idea, and end up with what we might call the L cross service on the right hand side. Well, this L cross service is obtained by identifying edges, like the vertical one shown here, we, we pair the two dark blue ones, we pair the two light blue ones, and we pair the two green ones. And there are edge identification for the horizontal edges as well, which I've not shown here.
A surprise is that one direction geodesics on the L cross surface actually is equivalent to the problem of one direction geodesics on the L surface. Let's look at the L cross surface in the picture on the left. Now we know that the two light blue edges identify with each other. So that allows us to move the rectangle number two to the right hand side of the rectangle number one. And then we see that the red edge is the right hand edge of two and the left hand edge of zero. And on the picture, in the picture on the right, we have the two edge identification for the L shape, L surface. We can do the same by moving four to about three. And so we end up with a one direction geodesic on the L surface. That simplifies our problem somewhat. Now let's suppose that V is a one direction half infinite geodesic on the L surface. And let's take an initial segment of V of length L. We denote that by VL. We say that V is super dense on P if there is a constant C such that if we go a distance of Cn, then we can get one, N, one over N close to every point in P. Therefore, to get near points in P, we just have to go far enough, enough. And the distance that we need to go, right, is a linear mult is a linear multiple of n, right? That's called super density. What we can prove is that. If we take, if we start with a slope equal to alpha, which is a badly approximable number, where every continued fraction digit is even. Now that's a very special condition where every con continued fraction digit is even. Then we have super density of the geodesic on the L service P. Now, what is it about the continued fraction digits being even? Let's have a look at the, some examples. Let's suppose that the first continued fraction digit is equal to two as shown in the diagram on the left. We consider what we call an almost vertical detour crossing of slope alpha. Now, the L shape, the L surface on the left, of the, if we take the two square faces on the left of this L, we call this a vertical street. And a vertical D2 crossing, you can think of it as a most inefficient way of crossing this street. We try to cross this street from the left to the right, and instead of going towards the other side, we rather go the very long way round be, by being more vertical than horizontal. It's a very inefficient way of crossing. And the shortcut, which is illustrated by the darker blue color, is clearly a much more efficient way of doing the same thing. And here we can see that the shortcut is also a, par, a, a geodesic that has positive slope. On the other hand, if the first continued fraction digit is equal to three, as shown in the picture on the right, then we see that the shortcut, which is now given in red, noting that the bottom left vertex of the L service and the top left vertex of the L service are identified with each other. 
the shortcut says negative slope. Now, we can deal with that. That's a completely different story, which we don't have time to do here. And we want to avoid this at the moment. So let's keep all our digits even right, for the time being. So we have our first almost vertical D2, D2 crossing in the picture on the left and the shortcut, which is almost horizontal. Now, when we say almost vertical, we simply mean that the slope is bigger than one. Almost horizontal simply means the slope is strictly less than one, nothing more than that. But we notice that these two geodesics intersect at the points O and C, which are on the vertical edges in the L surface. And in the picture on the right, we have our second almost horizontal shot, uh, horizontal, uh, second almost vertical D2 crossing together with the almost horizontal shortcut. And again, they intersect at these points C and D, which are on the vertical edges of the square faces and so on. Now, we take the first vertical D2 crossing, the second one, and there's a third one, and a fourth one, and so on, and together they make up the geodesic V. We have the first shortcut, the second shortcut, the third shortcut, and so on, and we put them together, and we end up with the short line. And the two of them satisfy this vertical same edge cutting property, right? They meet at, on the vertical edges of the square faces. Now, the almost horizontal short line H1 itself is a geodesic, right? So it also has a short line which we call V2, which is almost vertical. And interchanging the roles of the horizontal and the vertical, we see that these two now satisfy the horizontal same edge cutting property. And we can continue right, and have quite a few of them. Now in this picture, the little light blue segment from the point seven to the point six is part of the geodesic V2i, right? The short line of V2i is H2i plus one, and they intersect at the point six. And so five, six is part of H2i plus one, and the short line of H2I plus one is V2I plus two. They intersect at the point five and so on, right? Now, if we start from H2I plus five and move back towards V2I, we see that the lengths we can keep some control as to the ratio of the various lengths. And we also see that there's some very far zigzagging to the corner C. And this is one of the crucial ideas in the eigenvalue free short line method, which we shall illustrate in a minute. So we start with an almost vertical geodesic V. And let's suppose a V star is a long, rather long, finite initial segment of it. Then V star is made up of finitely many whole D2 crossings. And then there may be part of the last one. The length of V star would be equal to, say, some 
multiple of the square root of one plus alpha square. Now the square root of one plus alpha square is the length of one D2 crossing. Now, let's look at H1 star. H1 star, let's say H1 star is a finite segment of H1. Remember that H1 is the short line of V. V star has finitely many whole D2 crossings and one fractional D2 crossing. So each whole D2 crossing gives rise to a single shortcut. And the fractional D2 crossing gives rise to a fractional shortcut, right? And that makes up H1 star. But then if we put a few shortcuts together and perhaps a little bit more, we get a D2 crossing. So we can think of H1 star as being made up of finitely many whole D2 crossings and one fractional D2 crossing. And we can also write down its length, which is some multiple of one plus alpha one square square root. Square root of one plus alpha one squared is the length of one D2 crossing. And we can do likewise for V2 star, which is obtained as part of the short line V2 of H1. So this is the situation corresponding to V star, we have H1 star, V2 star, H3 star, and so on. We can write down their lengths. We can do a little calculation to their relationship. I won't spend too much time on this, but we have a sequence of numbers M0, M1, M2, M3, and so on. ML being a typical term. Remember that we are assuming that our number, our slope alpha is a badly approximable number. And since this is a badly approximable number, it means that there is some integer u which acts as an upper bound for the continued fraction digits, a strict upper bound. In that case, the u also is an upper bound of all the alphas. Now we make a claim. We claim that there is some one of these numbers ML, such that the corresponding line segment HL star exhibits all corner cuts that is shown in this picture. What we mean by that is that This is a corner cut, which means that part of HL star goes from this vertical edge to this horizontal edge. And part of HL star goes from this horizontal edge to this vertical edge, and so on. Right. Now, To understand this, we have to make a little definition. We look at these almost horizontal units in the L surface. Some of them give rise to corner cuts, others don't. The blue ones don't, the red ones do, because this bit here is a corner cut. This bit here is a corner cut, that's a corner cut, that's a corner cut, that's a corner cut, and that's a corner cut. Now, we need to look at what we mean by an ancestor unit. Remember, we start with a D2 crossing. And when you have a D2 crossing, you have a shortcut. 
ancestor units are the reverse of this. So when we talk about an ancestor unit, it is rediscovering the original D2 crossing. So in these two pictures, we start with an almost vertical unit, which is in pale blue, right? This is the shortcut of an almost horizontal D2 crossing. So we now go and rediscover this D2 crossing. In the picture on the left, it's quite clear that we have got a little bit of this red one, and then a whole unit of the green one, and then a whole unit of the purple one, and then a little bit of the brown one. In the picture on the right, we only have three of them. And they could be fractional at the two ends, right? These ancestor units. So all these different multicolored ones are the ancestor units. To substantiate our claim, this actually turns out to be very simple. Because if we go to from HL star, the next one is VL plus one star, the next one is HL plus two star, and the one after that is VL plus three star. Now start with VL plus three star, right? It must contain some unit. And now let us go and work out the three generation ancestor units. And if we do that, we find that we have everything. Therefore, we prove that there are all sorts of corner cups. That's it. That's a very, very simple argument. Next, let me explain what area magnification of intervals. Let's start with an interval I0, which is on a vertical edge of a square face. And we project it by the flow given by the direction one over alpha one. Here, we say that in these two pictures, we say that I1 is good in the sense that I1 sits within the same horizontal edge of a square face. And we can easily calculate the length of I1. It is magnified by the, by from the length of I0 by a factor alpha one. This magnification can be bad as shown in this particular picture because the image is split into two intervals and there is a singularity in between. Now, we're going to claim that if we start with an I0 on a vertical edge of a square face, and let's suppose that I0 does not intersect our V star. Remember, V star is a long initial section of the geodesic V. And suppose that V star doesn't intersect I0. We claim that the length of I0 cannot be too big. We have the upper bound given here. Let's suppose the contrary, that the length is bigger. Well, exponentially far zigzagging to a street corner, which we described a little earlier, shows that if I1 is bad, then it cannot be H1 star free, right? That's what is given by exponentially fast zigzagging, right? It needs a little bit of proof, but that's what we can show.
On the other hand, the same vertical edge cutting property means that I0 being V star free is also H1 star free because V star and H1 star intersect on the vertical edges. Right? So if, if I0 doesn't intersect V star, it doesn't intersect H1 star either, right? And that implies that I1 is H1 star free, right? And the only escape from this scenario is that I1 cannot be bad. So I1 is good and is H1 star free and we can calculate its length. It's the length of I0 times alpha 1. Now let's project I1 to I2. And a similar story tells us that I2 has to be good and we can work out the length and we can keep on going to I L minus one. And now alpha L times the length of I L minus one is now bigger than two. But if the length is bigger than two, then it must contain a whole edge of a square face and if it contains the whole edge of a square face, then it cannot be HL star free. And that's a contradiction. Right? If there is no contradiction in between, somewhere along here. Right? So anyway, that's the contradiction we need to prove that the length of I naught is rather small. And now we can do a bit of calculation. I won't go into the details. So we have shown that the length of I naught is small, and therefore we, we do some calculations. And once we finish the calculations, we end up having an inequality relating the length of I zero to the length of V star. And, and if one works a little bit, that basically gives us super density. Next, let us consider a finite polysquare surface. Previously, we have been looking at the L surface that only has three square faces, but a finite polysquare surface may have more square faces. So we can have horizontal streets and vertical streets. Horizontal streets and vertical, well, they are just consecutive. Uh, square faces and the length of a horizontal street is the length of square faces that are on the same horizontal level, right? And we can construct, because all the streets have finite lengths, we can work out the lowest common multiple of all the street lengths and end up with a number H, which is well-defined and finite. Now, The number H replaces the number two in our earlier result, because two was actually the street LCM of the L service. Whereas here we replace it by H. And so we look at badly approximate numbers where every continued fraction digit is a multiple of H. And then we can establish super density. Now, this quantity H seems to be some kind of rather arbitrary thing, right? We need it for our present method to work, but is it really necessary? In fact, it is not necessary at all. As Beck and I recently managed to show by a different method, right? that as long as the slope is badly approximable, then we have super density. But that's a different method altogether. And the same story for any billiard orbit with initial slope alpha in a finite polysquare region. 
This is to be checked very carefully again because it was very recent result. So maybe I sh we shouldn't claim it at this point. Next, let us talk about an L-square maze. What is an L-square maze? It is a finite or infinite polysquare surface where the street length is at most L. We cannot have streets that are infinite in length and the street lengths are all bounded by a number L. Then we can replace our H or the two previously by L factorial, which is clearly a least common, uh, a common multiple of all the possible street lengths. And to make things a little simpler, we've chosen that the continued fraction digits are equal to each other. And here we cannot prove super density. We can only prove density in the following sense. That in order to get one end close to every point in question, we have to go a length which is something like n to the three plus epsilon, right? Much bigger than n, or constant times n, right? Which is needed for super density. So we miss by perhaps two powers of n and a little bit more, right? So we get density, but not super density, but we still get time quantitative density. Now, let us go back to the periodic wind tree model. If we look at this, it's quite clear that there are horizontal and vertical streets that have unbounded lengths. So we cannot use, we cannot use any of our results, except if we consider a tilted street, that seems a very different story. This is a tilted street. And this second gray one is another tilted street, which is perpendicular to the original tilted street. So we can actually think of a square maze if we look northeast, southwest, and northwest, southeast rather than east-west and north-south, right? In other words, we can use our result for the maze. This is a finite tilted street. It is contained in four L shapes, right? We play billiard in each L shape. And if we unfold using Koenigsegg, we end up with four L crosses glued together in a suitable way. And this is the street that we started with after unfolding. So we actually ended up with a 12 square maze and we can use our theorem on L square mazes. So we have the result for the periodic Wintry model. But how about aperiodic modifications of this model? Let us split the periodic Wintry model into three by three blocks of obstacles and modify some of these blocks by removing the middle obstacle. So some blocks are now have nine obstacles, others only have eight with the middle one missing. There are uncountably many ways of doing this and the overwhelming majority of them give us aperiodic modifications of the periodic Wintry model. Now take a modified three by three block. It's surrounded by 15 more obstacles. This is a tilted street. It's covered by 11 L shapes and one square. So
So unfolding leads to an L square maze for some rather large number L, but L is finite. And again, we can use our result on L square mazes and say that we have infinitely many explicitly given initial directions of billion orbits that are dense in these aperiodic modifications of the wind tree model. Now we move up one dimension and consider a three dimensional problem. So we're now going to look at the L solid manifold, right? It consists of three cubes placed rather like the letter L in this picture. And there are obviously identification of various faces, right? We have a lot of X, a few X faces. Some are identified with others. We have Z faces and we also have Y faces, which I haven't shown. Let's look at a one direction geodesic on the L solid manifold. And let's start from the bottom left corner. Let's think of this as the origin. And let us go in the direction x, y, one. So from the origin, we end up at the point A. We keep on going up to the top face, top face. And once we hit the top face, we parachute down to the ground and we go up again in the same direction, get to the top, parachute down to the ground and go up again. And let's say after going up k times and we parachute down, we ended up at the point B prime and we go up in the same direction again. But before anything happens, we hit a vertical face and end up at the point C. And let us suppose that the point C is 1xy. Now, it's quite clear that between the origin and A and between this point B prime and C, the two line segments are parallel. And this gives rise to a couple of equations. And we can solve these equations. One of them is a cubic equation in X. And if we solve it, we find that there is a root that is between one over two K and one over two K plus one. So alpha K is our X. So our Y is alpha K squared, right? So this geodesic has direction vector alpha K, alpha K squared one. Now let us look at the short line, which is now given in the darker blue, right? It goes from zero, from the origin to the point C. The point C is one X, Y, X is alpha K, right? So the short line, let's call this L K star, has direction vector V one, which is given by one alpha K, alpha K squared. They share the same X phase hitting points. So they intersect. So LK and LK star intersect on LX faces. Now, look at the short line LK star. It is a geodesic in its own right. And so we can consider the short line which we denote by LK double star. And a similar argument would tell us that it has direction vector V2 given here, which is now just a shift of the entries from V1. And let us look at LK star. It has a short line and its direction vector is V naught again. 
But then remember that LK starts from the origin, LK star starts from the origin, LK double star starts from the origin, so that this last short line is nothing other than LK itself. So what we have is a short line process from LK to LK star. So LK star is a short line of LK. LK double star is a short line of LK star. But LK is the short line of LK double star. So our result is that any geodesic with direction vector V naught is dense in P. Dense in the sense that we need to go a length n to the two plus epsilon before we can get one n close to every point in P, in the, the L solid manifold. Now, if we were to obtain super density, then in three dimensions, we would need n squared. Here we have n two plus epsilon. So we miss by just a little bit, right? but unfortunately, we are not able to remove the epsilon, at least not at this stage. This is not super density, but it's still time quantitative density. How about a finite polycube manifold with street LCMH? We can do a similar exercise where the number H replaces the number two. And again, we get three direction vectors and we get a triple where we get short lines right, of each other. And here, again, we can prove almost superdensity, but not quite. Again, we miss by a factor epsilon. Using that, we actually managed to get the result on uniformity. This is the result. Our construction actually gives uniformity, but it gives uniformity only in the form of a qualitative result. And it doesn't tell you how uniform it is, right? We fall short of getting time quantitative uniformity because we only managed to get a lower bound. We were not able to, to do better at least at this point. Uh, and the argument here uses a Gothic theory plus our short line method and area magnification. Likewise, we can study L cube, L cube maze. And so with the L factorial replacing the two and the H, and we have a similar result we get density, but not super density. But this time, the density is not so good. Our, our exponent now grows to third, more than 38, which is, we actually had to work rather hard to get it down to 38. So now we might ask, how about the three-dimensional analog of the wind tree model. Unfortunately, we cannot apply it to the three-dimensional periodic wind tree model. Why is that? Well, in dimension two, we have tilted streets that are finite in length. Unfortunately, in three dimensions, we do not have a satisfactory analog. And therefore, we cannot say anything about the periodic wintry model. And that's where I finish our talk. Thank you very much.